some people have seen where God has brought you from. You don't know my story. You are about to hear the story of uh, my fraternity brother, Albert Marquise Williams. This brother has an awesome story, and it's one that I'm quite sure you would be able to identify with. Some of you definitely will be able to. It is heart throbbing, but listen to the story. Stay with the story and uh, see what remarkable things God does with your mess and with your test. And this story here really um, gives way and evidence to that. You never know the experiences, the stories that lie within a person when you see them, you know. And so I hope that you are encouraged and blessed by this story as I have been. I've asked Albert, who lives in Charleston, South Carolina, to um, pre-record and send me his story so that we can share with you. So he has done that. And so um, there's a little bit of um, delay with his voice and the movement. So please disregard that um, and be blessed. You don't know my story. Featuring you don't Albert know my story. Williams. The anguish and the guilt that consume me. Grateful I can tell. My name is Albert Marquis Williams. My story. My story begins in 1993. Was it born in 93? I was born in 86, but the earliest I can remember is 93. A little small country town, Clinton, South Carolina. It's my mother, Sherry. My father, Albert. My older sister, Marquita. We lived in this little small yellow house. They call it a shotgun house. See, when you open the front door, and if you open the back door, you can shoot your shotgun straight through it and miss everything. Out the front door and the back door. You can throw a rock out the front door and it can go out the back door if both doors are open at the same time, of course. It's a little two bedroom house for the den, living room, fairly large side kitchen. It was an older house. 1993 is the year Tiffany was born, my young assistant. Everything was good. Mom worked, dad worked, all sufficiency. Nothing lacking in the house. And one day the tables began to turn. My sister and I were in the room, playing, watching TV. We heard my mom crying, my dad cursing. They'd argued before, never got into fighting from us, never. My sister and I were scared, didn't know what to do. Me being seven, her being nine, we were helpless. Ran in the living room. Saw my dad beating on my mom as if he wanted to kill her. Blood gushing down her face, her arms, her neck. Blood everywhere. I thought she was gonna die. When he noticed that we were there, he stopped hitting her. She ran out of the door. Clothes almost torn off, blood everywhere. Running for her life. She ran to the neighbor's house. Mrs. Willie May and Mr. S Mr. Marcella, my younger sister Tiffany's godparents. 
She ran for refuge. After that, things weren't the same. About two years later, we moved into a bigger house. <laughs> I guess you can say my parents, they were doing well. We moved to this bigger house. It's three bedrooms. I have my own room. The two girls shared a room. I was 11. The neighbors had a trampoline. Sick is sick now. <laughs> Back flips, front flips, cartwheels, everything we can do on that trampoline. Tried to see who could bounce the highest. So that's where we were at the neighbor's house on the trampoline. My aunt, our feeder, her and my mom, they're like the closest two sisters. She happened to come over, knocked on the door. Nobody came to the door. She heard my dad and my mom argue, as they often did at this point. Still didn't come to the door. There was silence. She didn't hear anything else. So she's like, what the world? So she goes in. She finds my dad choking my mom. My mom's eyes rolling in the back of her head. Urine running down her legs. She picks up a lamp and she hits him up top of the head. He gets off of her, he stops. Shortly afterwards, my mom, she came to her senses, but she couldn't move her arm. Her arm was broken. Her nose was broken. Her eyes were black. She went to the hospital. They fixed her up. She came home in a few days. Afraid for her life. We all stopped and slept in Marquita's room. Put a dresser behind the door because we didn't know what my dad was going to do next. The beatings never stopped. It got worse. It got worse. My mom, she ended up leaving. We moved. My mother, two sisters and I. She worked nine to five, fighting for us. She finally married again. Had my younger brother, Kivas. We moved in with Stanley. And it was all hell again. This time, we couldn't watch TV. We couldn't play when he was there. We couldn't do anything. I remember the first time the beating started. watching TV. I heard a glass break. We ran to the kitchen. My mom was backed up in the corner. And he was pounding her in the head. Pounding her in the head. Nothing she could do but cover. As kids, we did only what we knew to do. We ran to the next door neighbor's house. As she had done in the past. 
called our grandma, told her what was going on. Ran back to the house and I yelled, get out of my mama! He comes charging at me. Boxing in the mouth. My teeth become bloody. There was nowhere to be found. At this point, I started walking around in school with my head down. Started misbehaving in school. I didn't want to be there. Life wasn't worth living. I was often criticized by family members. By the time I reached ninth grade, beating still continued. Everything was like a nightmare living there. Until one day, he was hitting my mom in the living room. Then they wore, they went off into the kitchen. The kitchen had this huge glass sliding door. So I picked up this lip, I picked up the dining room chair. I was gonna hit him with it. I was determined to get him off of my mom. But instead, I threw the chair at the door. It didn't crack the door, but it sounded as if it did. He was shocked. Somebody stood up to me. So shocked that he called the police on me. When the police got there, he asked, What's the problem? And Stanley told the police that I was disrespectful, that I didn't want to listen that I was throwing furniture around. My mom stood there in fear and said nothing. She said nothing. The police didn't ask me any questions. They didn't ask me if it was true then he asked this, son, do you have somewhere to go? I looked at my mom. She looked at me. Hopeless. Helpless. She stood there in silence. As the police took me to my grandma's house, in my mind, the only thing I could contemplate was, <sighs> nobody loves me. I'm all alone. I have my dad who's in the same city who I haven't seen in three, four, five years. My mom can't even take up for me, even though I tried to take up for you. 12 years old, feeling all alone. It's the worst feeling in the world. So I stayed with my grandma for a few days. Went to school, getting suspended, getting in fights, doing this, doing that. Then my grandma asked if I wanted to move in with my aunt sent. Moved in over there. I 
around 13 or 14, I started carrying an odor. Often criticized. Couldn't sit down on the couch. Couldn't do this, couldn't do that. They never said anything to me, but they would always get on the phone and talk to, me. to my grandma. I remember one conversation, she called my mom and she told my mom that I could no longer live there if my mom didn't start paying her. And because my mom refused to pay her, I had to move with my granny. When I moved with my grandma's mother, Catherine, it was just me, her, and one of my cousins. Granny was a praying woman. Every morning, six o'clock, Granny would get up singing, hymning, praying. As she washed clothes, as she as she as she hung out her clothes at four, five, six o'clock in the morning, colored, then white, hanging the jeans upside down so that they can drain faster. often mimic her as she would pray as she would sing pass me not oh gentle sea one day she caught me doing it she was like boy you don't know what you're talking about <laughs> I was like I do <laughs> it was with her I started going to church I started going to church and I started hearing about this man they call Jesus. At the age of 13, 2002. I started hearing about this man they call Jesus and how he walked on water and healed the blind and healed the sick, raised the dead. I started hearing about this man who fed the multitude. I started hearing about this man who who allowed Moses to be a vessel and parted the Red Sea and I started hearing about this man who encouraged people that they were more than conquerors, that they were more than overcomers, that the latter will be greater. Hey, I started hearing about this man that reminded people that greater is he that is in them, that he that is in the world, and because of that no weapon formed against them shall prosper. I started hearing about this man who, who, who told us that death and life are in the power of the tongue and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. I started hearing about this man who came so that he may be a perfect example. I started hearing about this man who gave his, his life. For you and for I, I started hearing about this man who, who died rose on the third day and now sits on the throne. And I'm beginning to walk with my head up. Who told us that death and life are in the power of the tongue and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. So I heard about this man who came so that he may be a perfect example. So I hear about this man who gave his, his life. For you and for I, I start hearing about this man who, who died, who rose on the third day, and now sits on the throne. And I'm beginning to walk with my head up. I'm beginning to get self-confident. You see, it was at this place I found out who and whose I was. It was at this place I found out that I'm an overcomer. And that my past could either make me or could break me. You see, it was at this place I had a pivotal moment to where I was determined for 
greatness. Tenth grade, I started focusing on my purpose in life. I started focusing on the desires of my heart. I started praying. I started speaking those things that are not as though they were. I enrolled myself into all honors classes. I was determined to do it. Went to the garden council. She tried to tell me I didn't need to do it because I had never been in honors classes before. And she told me I would have to get my mom's permission. So I took the paper home. I was like, Mom, sign this. She signed it. <laughs> From 10th grade to senior year, I was on the honor roll every semester. Finishing high school with a 3.7 GPA. Rode into college. After my aunt said I wouldn't make it. After she said I wouldn't graduate from high school. Hey, yeah, kind of bullshit. After she said I'll never amount to anything. <laughs> I rode into college and <laughs> I was in and out in four years. Been the first person in the entire immediate family to graduate. Not only just from like any institution, but from, from a four-year institution, being the first person in the entire family, the one that they didn't think would amount to anything. Oh, but God, but God. You know, it's funny how life plays out. How we think that we're all alone, and we think that things are gonna work out for our good, and. You know, we've been shifted from place to place to place to place. Oh, but when I look back, I see that it was just building my character. I see that it was just making me the person that I am now. Mm. And now I know that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Oh, man. Something that I learned at the, a very, very young age is that the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Amen. Oh, man, when I look back over my life and I see that God has kept me through every situation, I can't help but praise Him the way I do now. I can't help but stand in expectation that each round, hey, hey, Karabo, say each round is going to be higher and higher. I want to say to you, no matter what you're going through, no matter what your storm is, no matter what your trial, no matter what your situation is, hold on. <laughs> the reason you need to hold on is because help is on the way. I know what it feels like to be all alone. I know what it feels like when everybody is against you. You see, the very person that taught me the song, Yes, Jesus Loves You, my grandmother Hazel, she turned her back. Not even realizing that the very thing that she taught me was the very thing that was going to get me through that situation. Now I know that love conquers all. Just like Christ forgives, I have to forgive my father. For one, mistreating my mom, mistreating us. For two, for not being a man and stepping up to the plate to take care of his responsibilities. And now, I'm trying to get to know him. I'm trying to get to know who he is because I, I didn't know him growing up even though he was just a few rows away. It's funny how life works out. It's funny. Stay encouraged. You're more than a conqueror. 
You're more than an overcomer. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. God came to this earth. You can't avoid it. Flesh in the form of man so that he can feel your pain. Live through it. So that he can know what it feels like. He knows what you're going through. You know he said that he knew who we were even before we were formed in our mother's womb. He knew I was going to be at this place. Even when I was seven and I was seeing my mom beaten and blood coming everywhere. He knew I was going to be at this place. He knew that one day I would be the person that spoke things as though they were, Heavenly Father. He knew that one day I was going to be the person <laughs> who got up in the morning and just said, Hey, kakara bo shena na hey ka shena yo ho sa yena na ho bo ko sheta. He knew I was going to be the person that worship you when I'm good, when I'm feeling bad, in the midst of trial, in the midst of peace. He knew that I was going to be the person that surrendered myself to him totally. He knew I was going to be the person that I am today. I challenge you it always hurts more to not focus on your situation. I challenge you to not focus on your circumstances, but I challenge you to focus on the expectation but don't worry. that you have of God. You gotta understand. That expectation should be an expectation that <laughs> He's Jehovah Jireh. Everything that you stand in need of, God's got it. That expectation should be an expectation that he's a healer. That expectation should be an expectation that he sets the captive free. You see, that was my issue. I was bound. I was bound. Bound by negative criticism. Bound by negative words from family members telling me that I'll never amount to anything. I needed a word from God. I needed a word from God. When I started hearing, the greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Hey, it started shaking my spirit. <laughs> when I started hearing, hey, I'm more than a conqueror. I'm more than an overcomer. You see, positive words, they recreate your atmosphere. You know, sometimes you have to encourage yourself. Have to speak a word. I challenge you. That in the midst of storms, in the midst of trials, in the midst of situation, stand fast, anchor in the Lord. Hey, be of good courage and He will strengthen your heart. Even if it takes you looking yourself in the mirror to say, I can make it. Even if it takes you looking yourself in the mirror to say, I'll get over this. Even if it takes you to daily remind yourself that God is with you. And if he can be with you, who can be against you? Thank you, God. Stay encouraged. God is with you. Always. I love you. God loves you. Love. Never fails. Love that conquers all. Learn to forgive. Forget. Move on. Be blessed. Wow. That was his story. What is your story? How? What has God brought you through? What has God allowed you to experience? But you come to find out Romans 8.28. All things have worked together for your good. We welcome your story. And we also welcome your financial support or support of any other way. We also welcome you to advertise here on You Don't Know My Story TV. God bless you. Thank you for tuning in for this episode. This is your host, Pastor G. God bless.